Welcome to our newest edition of Insider Outsider. Today, our special guest is Alka Joshi, whose runaway bestseller is The Henna Artist. As you all know, Insider Outsider is a series of talks with writers and artists who live and work abroad. Welcome to our show, Alka. We are so pleased to have you with us. Thank you, Nandita. It is my pleasure to be here with all of you. Can you tell us about your writer journey and also a few anecdotes about how it felt to rediscover yourself as an author? Getting the Hannah Artist to publication was a 10-year process. I started at the age of 51. I went to get my MFA and the henna artist became my thesis, but there was still a lot of work to be done to make it publishable. I didn't work on it for about two years while I was working full time just to pay my bills and my mortgage and so on. And then I, when I went back to it, it was my thesis advisor who said, let's work on this a little bit and see if we can send it to my agent. We did, we sent it off to her agent and her agent said, I love this, I wanna represent you, Alka. Okay, that sounded great. But then four to five years later, we're still working on it. And then I said, when are we going to publish this? And she said, well, now you need to find a developmental editor. Oh, my gosh. I had no idea what that was. So finally, I find myself a developmental editor. She gives me a whole bunch of corrections and suggestions and improvement ideas for the novel. And I just thought, no, this is too much work. I'm not going to do this. Writing is too hard. I'm putting this book away. So I did. And then I didn't work on it again for a few more years. And then finally, you know, I ran across it. I start reading it. I love it. I actually like my own writing. And I'm thinking, I love this world that Lakshmi is in. So let me see if I can work on it again. And I dug out the edits from the developmental editor. I worked on the edits and then finally sent it back to my literary agent. And uh, about the nine year mark, she sold it to HarperCollins. <laughs> so it took a long time. I think a lot of what happened with me is that I really thought I would be an artist in my life. I think as as early as I could possibly hold a pencil, I was drawing. I was drawing on every surface around me. So it never occurred to me that I could be a writer. Well, I go for my first advertising job and I want to apply for art director. I show them my portfolio and they say, well, we want to hire you as a writer. And I said, why? I want to be an art director. And they said, because you're obviously a very good writer. Look at your portfolio. So I became a writer. Then I'm doing all my advertising and marketing. This is how I made a living for 30 years. And uh, my husband said, you know, I think you can be a long form fiction editor. I said, what? I said, no, 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 I'm just an advertising hack. He said, no, I think you can write long form fiction and I think you'd be really good at it. So that's when I actually started taking myself seriously as a writer. Now I think, Nandita, what I would call myself is an artistic writer. So I am able to bring color and texture and scent into my writing, almost as if I were painting the words on a canvas. That's how it feels to me. And I hope that's how it feels to everyone else, because it gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to combine the art with the writing. Just how difficult is it to live abroad and try and recreate things from Indian history? It's not difficult at all. The henna artist takes place in the 1950s, and I had my parents' experiences to rely upon for that. Also, my brothers and I were all born in India in the 1950s and lived there for the first nine, 10 years of our lives. So I had my own experiences to draw upon. 
And I also watched Indian movies of that time period. They're really charming, uh, the black and whites from the 1950s. And then I, uh, of course, read lots of novels. I read uh, Tagore, I read Markandaya, uh, Narayan, uh, Ruth Prower Jabvala. I read so many books that took place in that era of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And uh, then, of course, um, I made lots of trips to India. So that is the easiest way to get back in touch with your heritage and to write about India. Just make a few trips. Talk to people who are still there. Talk to people who may have been alive during the time period you're writing about. And they will remember, they will remember anecdotes that they can share with you that may make your way into the book. Um, in my parents' case, my father is always speaking in Proverbs, so a lot of those Proverbs made it into the book. Um, my mother had a story about her dowry gold and how she had to, to sell it, so that made it into the book. Um, there were so many uh, instances of people telling me things about their lives that then I could incorporate in some way into a character. And then, of course, um, there are books like A Princess Remembers, which was written by the late Maharani Gayatri Devi, which informed me a lot of what was happening in the palaces and what their lives were like as Maharanis. So um, there was a lot of information out there that I could actually rely upon. And of course, all of the henna work in here is just completely from my imagination. And uh, the majority of the characters, I would say 95% of the characters are completely from my imagination. And that is a fun place for me to live in. <laughs> I am extremely intrigued. Why would you choose the 1950s as the setting of your debut novel? How difficult has it been? And what have been your learnings from this exercise? I watched a movie from 1955, and it was called Mr. and Mrs. 55. That was the year that divorce became legal in India. So I started from 1955. It was also the year that my parents were married, coincidentally, uh, in India in an arranged marriage. And so I borrowed heavily from their lives in the 1950s. I also wanted to cover a period of history that does not normally get covered in fiction or in the movies. And that is the idea of the post-independence era as being a rebirth of Indians themselves, uh, a way for them to rebuild their country, to rebuild all of the buildings and dams and bridges. These are things that my father as a civil engineer in India in the 1950s was heavily involved in. And of course, it was an era where Indians finally felt the relief of being able to carry out their own traditions, their own religious uh, fervor, their own festivities, their own traditions without the British looking over their shoulder. And I wanted to capture that for 300 million Indians who must have felt such a sigh of relief when the British left <laughs> and also the exuberance they felt in rebuilding their country. How does the community you live in and the community you interact with back home accepted this book and how have their contributions added to the phenomenon that is uh, the henna artist? Well, here in the West, as you know, the New, the New York Times, the LA Times, uh, USA Today, Toronto Star, Globe and Mail, all of these publications have named the henna artist as a bestseller because it is selling so well and audiences here love learning about the history of India and what it's like in the 1950s. They also love learning about history from a woman's perspective because women have a right to also be part of the literary canon when it comes to history. And learning about history from a female's perspective is very important. It was so critical to me that in this book, we convey the lives of many different kinds of women from all different castes, from different classes, and what is happening to them in 1950s India. And so people in the West are picking up on that now. It was really also very important for me that this book resonate with Indians, both in India and across the global diaspora. 
and it has. It was one of my biggest concerns that perhaps they would not accept this book as uh, something written by, you know, somebody like me who has lived in the West since the age of nine. But in reality, I have infused so much reality and history and, um, you know, the smells and the sights and the sounds of India into this book and done so much research and talked to so many people to make it as authentic as I possibly can, that the feedback I get from Indian readers is that they love the book. They love the book. It makes them proud of their heritage. If they've never been to Rajasthan, they want to go to Rajasthan now. They want to go to Jaipur. They want to go to the palaces. They want to know what it's like to eat dal bati. <laughs> so um, a lot of this has been a great learning experience for me in how people around the world are curious about other cultures, want to accept other cultures, and want to emulate other cultures, uh, taking the best of what they can glean from something that they don't know very much about and incorporating it into their own lives. And that, I can tell you, is one of the best rewards that an author can receive. Alka, it's no secret that your book is fabulous. If you were to try and persuade our viewers to go out and read it, what would you say? That is an excellent question, Nandita. I have never had that question before. Hmm. I think that what I would say is this is a book about women and the choices that we all deserve to make that determine the destinies of our lives. Every single woman, whether she is from a village or from a wealthy family, has the right to have all the options in front of her, all the ways in which she can grow and nurture and take care of and realize her destiny. I think these are so important. These are such important uh, tenets to carry across in this book. Each of the female characters and each of the male characters helps us realize the power that women have and the power they deserve to have. I think I would also tell people that you're going to be reading a history about India that does not get conveyed in very many uh, pieces of fiction or the movies. You're going to learn about India post partition. A lot has been written about partition, but think about the 300 million Indians who were very excited after the British left. The British had destroyed so much industry in India, so much commerce, and it was important for Indians to recreate all of that. Uh, it was so important for Indians to pick themselves back up and say, we can rebuild our country. And that comes across very clearly in the henna artist. In addition to that, I talked a lot about the healing herbs, uh, the spices, the very natural ingredients we use in our food uh, in South Asian cooking that I think um, is fascinating to all readers all around the world. Uh, the idea that Indians feel no conflict between adopting an Eastern modality and a Western modality in, uh, in regards to their health. They feel that whatever is beneficial for them, they should adopt, carry on. If you want to adopt something else, that's okay with them. And if, if they want to do something different from you, that's okay with them too. But this idea of being able to combine the traditional and the modern is something that is very clearly in all aspects of the henna artist with every character and with every situation that comes up. So I think that all of these are super uh, important takeaways from the henna artist. In addition to just being a lovely story about a woman who's trying very hard to um, maintain her dignity while she's in a vulnerable position as a single woman who is trying to hide uh, from the past that she deserted her husband. Tell us what makes you intensely Indian, and if possible, share a memory of India that never leaves you. I think what makes me intensely Indian is also what makes me a good writer. And what I call it is the magic of the three Ps, persistence, patience, and perseverance. And I think Indians have all three in abundance. I think that we work very hard to achieve what we want. 
I think that we have very clear goals for ourselves, how far we want to go in our lives and how much we're willing to sacrifice to achieve that. Um, and I think that this idea of I can do it, I can do it, I can do it without being thwarted from it by other people or um, people who tell us that we can't make this happen or we are not good enough at this or that. You know, we just persist. We persist, we persevere, and we use our patience uh, to get ahead. Uh, something that has always stayed with me, of course, <laughs> and actually I can't forget it now because uh, my aunt is the one who always used to say to me, uh, the little lullaby that I inserted into the book. And this is the way that the two sisters recognize each other, even though they've never met before. And the lullaby goes like this. Rando Rani, Bariseani, Piti, Tanda, Tanda, Pani, Lake and Kirti, He So, um, it's, uh, it's something that my aunt used to sing to me. And, uh, then my father took it up. And my father is now 88 years old. He is an amazing person. He pray, plays bridge. He walks two miles a day. Um, he is truly a remarkable intellectual also. He's a professor emeritus of the University of Calgary up in Canada. And uh, he picked it up, I think, after we left India and then we came here to the United States. So he sings it to me even to this day sometimes when he calls me. He will start off the conversation with Alka Rani, Buddy Sayani, Pipi Tanda Tanda Pani, which I just think is adorable. And of course, uh, I think as I mentioned before, all of those proverbs that he is used to spewing that are from his family, that are from uh, his teachers, and he is he still speaks in proverbs oftentimes as the best way, I think, of communicating a very strong message with few words. So I think that that's lovely. The other things that I can never forget are of course Indian food. And I included so much food in the novel because I don't think you can talk about India without talking about Indian food. So my favorites are aloo gobi ki sabji, which I did put in the book. I love aloo kaparantas. I like uh, Rogan Josh. I like there are so many wonderful foods uh, that I just love uh, in Indian cooking. And I think it's one of the healthiest kinds of foods for us. So uh, I adore uh, the cooking. Anytime that I smell curry, immediately I will start salivating because I'm ready to eat now. <laughs> there were so many times when I was writing The Henna Artist that I would get so hungry, I would have to put down the computer and I would have to go order myself some Indian food and eat it right away. So um, yeah, I think that the food always stays with me. I think some of the scents of India always stay with me. Sandalwood, oh, such a wonderful scent. And vetiver. I don't know if you remember Nandita, but when I was a kid in India, we had these couscous fans. And the couscous is, of course, made from the vetiver grass. Uh, and it had the most wonderful fragrance. Once you wet the fan and you wave it in front of you on a hot day, you have the most wonderful fragrance all around you. So at the same time that the fan is cooling you with its uh, dampness, you're also getting this heavenly scent. So there's that, there's of course rose oil and jasmine oil and all of the um, sort of heavy uh, base notes that go into uh, many of our fragrances today. So those are all uh, with me, even to the, e even as I'm talking to you about them, I can smell them in my imagination, in my mind. So I love that. I also love the flowers of India, so many colors. And even though marigolds don't have a scent, they are so representational of uh, all of the festivals we have in India with the garlands, the marigold garlands. And they're such a substantial flower. They last forever and they keep away mosquitoes. So thank God. <laughs> so um, I love all of these things about India and I love the saris and I love my mother's saris. I still have them today, even though my mother's no longer with us. Um, I just, there's just so many things about India to cherish and I cherish them to this day and I will keep cherishing them until the day I die. 
so sorry to hear of your mother's passing. Unfortunately, this is the story of all our journeys. And these are things that knit us closer together. It's interesting that you spoke about the vetive or khas uh, fans in your stories. Uh, from where I come, typically it's also used to make what we call screens. So they are like curtains that keep out the sun. And, you know, they are, uh, uh, people spray water uh, on them. So as they evaporate, as the water evaporates, it cools the entire room down as well as releases that beautiful scent of vetiver. Thank you so much for being with us, Alka. I would like you to leave our viewers with just one thought. What next for Alka Joshi? Of course, I already know that your next two books are on their way. If you would like to speak about them or about anything that comes to you, please do share. Thank you so much for being my guest. You've been a fabulous, fabulous writer to have discovered. And for my viewers, please do watch Insider Outsider as often as you can. Thank you. Well, Nandita, it has been my pleasure to be talking to you today for Insider Outsider. Here is what I can tell you about the sequels. Last year, I had started on a whole new project and Malik, one of the characters from the henna artist, would not leave me alone. He kept coming into my imagination saying, I have a story to tell, please tell my story. So I started working on his story. By December of last year, before the henna artist was even out in the stores, the publisher had bought the sequel. And the sequel is about Malik at the age of 20. He has finished his boarding school education and Lakshmi is determined to put him on the straight path to a good career. And she finds an apprenticeship for him down at the Jaipur Palace. And that's where he goes, leaving behind a love interest who is not happy about him being gone. So that is uh, number two. And the third sequel is going to be about Ratha working as a perfumer in France. You know, I talked a little while ago about how important scents are in India, in my DNA, and uh, in my books. And so right now I'm just having a ball researching so much about perfume, where perfume comes from, where the ingredients come from, how petals are harvested, um, how we use natural and synthetic ingre ingredients in perfume. So Radha is working in Paris. Uh, she has a French husband and two little girls. She is working as a perfumer in one of the big fragrance houses. And uh, somebody from her past is going to visit her. Somebody from the henna artist past is going to visit her. And then we will see how Radha handles uh, her comeuppance. <laughs> so that is going to be book number three. And then, of course, Miramax TV is developing a TV series about the henna artist. It'll be an episodic TV series, hopefully multi-seasonal. You know, we'll find out. But uh, they are going to take all of these wonderful characters from the book and give them uh, life uh, in each of the episodes of the series. Frida Pinto will star in that. And Michael Edelstein, who's one of the other producers, uh, oversaw the production of Downton Abbey. And he sees the henna artist as an Indian Downton Abbey production. So a lot of great uh, production values that will go into this and great cast and of course, an amazing uh, director and cinematographer whom I hope will be women. And that will be uh, an amazing thing for me. It will make me proud to have more women on the uh, cast and crew of The Henna Artist. Um, so I am just really excited about this journey that I have taken with The Henna Artist and then with the two books, with the TV series, I don't know where life is going to lead me, but at the age of 62, I feel like I have just invented a whole new career and this phase of my life is just starting. Thank you so much for having me, Nandita. <laughs>